Cersei and Jaime discuss their strategy and their enemies. Jaime points out their lack of allies and questions Cersei's power. He expresses his will to discuss Tommen's suicide, but she refuses, calling the youngest child a traitor. She later reveals that she has considered a new ally, Euron Greyjoy. Euron arrives to ask Cersei to marry, but she declines, stating that she cannot trust him. Jaime then reminisces about Euron's primary role in the Greyjoy Rebellion, including the sack of Lannisport and is less than impressed when Euron proposes to Cersei, but is relieved when she refuses his proposal. Jamie is present when Cersei convenes a court of Reachmen, including Randall Tarly, who are asked to betray their oaths to Olena Tyrell, who has recently joined forces with Daenerys. Jamie then manages to get Randall on his own, after a brief confusion of names with his son, Dickon Tarly, who is mistaken as, Rickard, to Jamie. He then makes it clear that Randall is the most prominent of the Lords of the Reach, and that the others will look to him when choosing sides. Despite Jamie mentioning the possibility of the Dothraki invading his lands, Randall still announces that he doesn't wish to be dishonorable to Olena. Jamie then promises to give him the title of Warden of the South, should they succeed in triumphing over Daenerys. Jamie is present when Euron Greyjoy presents his captives of Yara Greyjoy and Alaria and Tyene Sand as his promised gift to Cersei. As they stand beside the throne as Cersei proclaims Euron commander of her naval forces as well as assuring him of her hand in marriage once the war is won, Jaime quietly mutters that the same people who cheered for Euron would do the same if Cersei put his head on a spike. Euron ignores the jab, but responds with one of his own by asking Jaime for advice on how Cersei enjoys sex. A furious Jaime almost lunges at Euron, but Euron, delighted at having provoked him, gleefully tells Jaime to save it for later in a not-so-public place. Soon after, Jaime is seen dining in his chambers when Cersei enters the room, and proceeds to disrobe him. They have sex, and then the next morning, they are woken by a servant ringing the doorbell. Jaime urges Cersei to ignore it, and expresses shock when she decides to answer the door, as nobody should see him sleeping in Cersei's bed, but Cersei retorts that she is the queen and can do whatever she wants. When Cersei opens the door, the servant tells her that the representative from the Iron Bank of Bravos is ready to meet with her, and her eyes catch on to the sight of Jaime in Cersei's bed, before quickly walking away. Cersei smiles as Jaime's concern turns to amusement. Jaime is next seen leading the combined Lannister Tarly army, along with Bronn, Randall, and Dickon Tarly in the final assault against Highgarden. In the aftermath of the assault and the massacre of the castle's Tyrell garrison, passing through his own soldiers counting up the spoils of victory, Jaime confronts Olena Tyrell in her study. Jaime notes that the Tyrell forces fought bravely, whereupon Olena acknowledges warfare was not House Tyrell's strong point. Olena observes that Tyrion and Daenerys thought the bulk of the Lannister forces would be defending Casterly Rock against the unsullied attack. Jaime, while pouring two glasses of wine, reveals it was a ruse, explaining that his ancestral home is now practically worthless, aside from childhood sentiment. A token garrison was left behind and the rock's food stores were emptied before they fled. He also states Euron's Iron Fleet will have destroyed the attacking fleet, leaving the Unsullied trapped deep in Westeros at the mercy of Lannister forces. Meanwhile, the main Lannister army would be far away from the main attack, a strategic move Jaime learnt from Rob Stark's attack at the Whispering Wood. Olena wonders why Tywin Lannister didn't just take Highgarden when Casterly Rock's mines first ran out of gold. Knowing her end is near, she remarks that she may ask Tywin himself soon enough. Olena asks Jaime how he intends to kill her, speculating he will kill her with Widow's Wail, Joffrey Baratheon's old sword. Remarking on Joffrey's horrible nature, Olena proudly admits that she enacted measures to protect her family at all costs, with no regrets, but reflects that her actions pale in comparison to the atrocities performed by Cersei. She tells Jaime that Cersei is a monster, a matter of opinion according to Jamie. While some may dread her, Jamie insists that none will care what she has done, so long as order is restored. Olena observes that Jamie really does love his sister, and calls him a fool, claiming that she will be the end of him, and that by the time he realizes what a disease Cersei is, it will be far too late for him. Jamie considers this a moot point, of little value discussing with Olena, although she points out that as an experienced person about to die, she is the perfect person to discuss his life with. Olena again asks Jaime how he plans to kill her. Jaime tells her of Cersei's idea of having her whipped and beheaded, or flayed alive and hanged, but he talked her out of those ideas. 
He then produces a small phial and empties its contents into one of the glasses of wine, giving it to Olena who then drinks it after Jamie confirms that it will be a painless death. Olena reflects on the horrible way that Joffrey died, and the gruesome details that the poison caused. She admits that part was unintentional on her part, as she had never seen the strangler work in person before. Shocked into silence, Jamie stares at her, realizing at last who really killed his eldest son and let his brother take the blame, setting in motion the deaths of Oberyn Martell, Tywin Lannister, and Marcella Baratheon. Satisfied at his horror, Olena insists that he tell Cersei that she was the one who murdered her son, where after a furious Jamie storms out, leaving Olena to die. Later, Jamie coordinates the soldiers loading up the spoils of war for transport after the sack of Highgarden allowed them to seize all of House Tyrell's substantial gold stores, which they send ahead to King's Landing first, before moving on to securing grain shipments. Jamie procures a large bag of gold coins and gives it to Bronn as payment for his services. Bronn, however, is annoyed that this isn't the full reward he was promised, which included a wife from the nobility and a castle. He then half seriously asks why Jamie doesn't just grant him Highgarden, as they need someone to rule it. Jamie waves this aside by saying they don't actually intend to hold Highgarden for long as it would be difficult for Bronn of all people to rule over hostile territory, and the war isn't over yet, so at this point he thinks Bronn should be satisfied with a more movable big sack of gold than a castle he'll have trouble defending. Bronn, however, is not amused. Some time later, Jamie's Lannister army has advanced much farther east along the Gold Road, in the northeast of the Reach. Lord Randall Tarly comes to Jamie and says they should hurry to get all of the grain wagons over the Blackwater Rush to King's Landing on the northern side, as they will be vulnerable if their formation is caught on both sides of the river. Jamie agrees, but Randall suggests flogging the stragglers to motivate them. Jamie urges that his soldiers fought well at Highgarden, however and he should at least give them a fair warning first instead of launching right into the flogging. Jamie and Bronn then encounter Randall's son Dick and Tarly again. Jamie asks what he thought of his first taste of battle, and he nervously claims it was glorious, only to then dejectedly admit that he was quite conflicted. House Tarly had been loyal vassals of the Tyrells for generations, he knew many of the men they killed, even hunted side by side with them. Jamie earnestly advises the young man that the guilt is not his but Elena Tyrell's as she was the one who chose to side with Daenerys's foreign army against Queen Cersei, so it is truly Elena's fault they died and the fact that Dickon wasn't involved with the decision-making process on either side means he shouldn't dwell on it. Dickon then outright confesses that the aftermath was horrible, notably the smell of all the fresh corpses. Bronn playfully taunts that Dickon, a sheltered nobleman, finally found out that men void their bowels when they die. Upon reaching the gold road by the Blackwater River, Jamie and Bronn are surprised to hear what sounds like distant thunder, until they realize it must be approaching cavalry. Jamie and Randall shout for their soldiers to form up, which they manage to do before the enemy crests over the horizon, a massive, 100,000-strong horde of Dothraki cavalry. Bronn insists that Jamie should just leave and ride ahead to King's Landing, but Jamie insists he will not abandon his men. Bronn bluntly tells him the Dothraki will swamp the Lannister lines and Jaime is too valuable as a commander to stay and fight, but Jaime insists that they have a chance if they hold. At that moment, they hear a roar not heard on the battlefields of Westeros in over a century and a half, and look above the Dothraki horde to see a huge adult dragon heading straight for their lines, Drogon, ridden by Daenerys Targaryen herself. Drogon outpaces the Dothraki, and at Daenerys's command, Dracarys, he blasts a torrent of fire through the Lannister ranks in a straight line from front to back, punching a hole in their formation. The highly mobile Dothraki light cavalry immediately sweep through it and wheel around to catch those parts of the Lannister lines in an envelopment. The Lannister Tali lines around Jaime and Randall manage to rally under their leadership, however, the Dothraki charge into the Lannister lines head-on, but meet stiff resistance as their spear wall holds firm. Though they are outnumbered, the Lannister soldiers are better armed heavy infantry, highly disciplined and battle-hardened veterans from years of war. Dothraki horse archers let off shots before charging into their ranks, but highly trained Tali archers return fire, doing as much if not more damage as the Dothraki wear less armor. The Lannister army gives as good as it takes for a time, but their enemy has the advantage of weight in numbers, and the tide turns slowly against them. For a moment it looks like Jaime might at least be able to force the Dothraki to a standstill but then Daenerys wheels out of the air again, devastating the Lannister formations. 
No longer trying to punch vertical holes through their lines, she switches to flanking the Lannister ranks, burning a vast horizontal swath of men from left to right. Men are flash burned into nothing but ash which crumbles upon the touch. Men are cooked alive in their own armor as they struggle to rip it off. Nonetheless, Jamie manages to rally his remaining forces a second time, desperately taking command of a group of surviving Lannister and Tali archers and directing them to concentrate their fire at the dragon. Drogon might not be vulnerable to common arrow fire, but his rider is. If they can manage to kill Daenerys herself, who has risked appearing in open battle, the entire war could end in a day, no matter their losses. Daenerys sees the attack coming, however, and banks Drogon up so the arrow volley harmlessly bounces off the armored scales on his belly. He then blasts the archer formations with fire. Jaime avoids the flames and is surrounded by enemies, but he manages to carve a path through the Dothraki with his sword widow's whale to try to reach safety. He nearly gets attacked by a Dothraki from behind at one point, but Dick and Tali kills the Dothraki first, saving him. Even then all is not lost, Jamie also commanded Bronn to reach Kyburn's anti-dragon scorpion bolt launcher, which they took with them in the wagon train for just this scenario, as Jamie cannot fire it one-handed. Bronn spots the dragon in the distance, and fires but misses. Daenerys is startled by the scorpion bolt flying a few feet from her head, scans the battlefield, and spots Bronn on the scorpion as he reloads. Bronn eventually manages to shoot Drogon in the shoulder, but the scorpion is destroyed immediately after by Drogon's dragonfire. To Jaime's disadvantage, the dragon's armored scales are so tough that the scorpion bolt only managed to cause superficial damage. Nonetheless the flesh wound grounds him, and he howls in pain and fury, destroying any masses of enemy soldiers that get near him. Daenerys sets him down and dismounts to try and pull the scorpion bolt out. Jaime, however, sees that Daenerys is grounded and immobilized, and realizes he still has one chance. If he can kill Daenerys, even now, he can end her invasion. Jaime grabs a spear and charges his horse across the flaming battlefield to make a death run for Daenerys as she tends to her dragon. Tyrion, who is watching the battle from a safe distance along with the Dothraki commanders, swears under his breath, calling his brother a fucking idiot, angry that he's going to get himself killed. Just as Jaime is nearly on top of Daenerys, however, Drogon notices him amidst the chaos of the battle. Shielding Daenerys behind his head, the dragon lets out a blast of flame, but Bronn rushes over to tackle Jaime out of the way, saving him from certain death. They both fall into the river, where Jaime is weighed down by his armor, and sinks beneath the waters, in danger of drowning. Jaime is pulled ashore by Bronn, who rebukes him for making such a reckless gamble. Realizing there is no chance their armies can beat Daenerys Targaryen at war, especially if she makes use of all three dragons, Jaime knows he must tell Cersei the bad news, to which Bronn suggests it may be better if he jumped back into the water. When he arrives back at King's Landing, he brings the news of the defeat, and that fighting Daenerys is suicide, only to be rebuffed by Cersei's overconfidence in the Iron Bank and the mercenaries that can be hired with the ransacked gold of Highgarden. As promised, he also tells Cersei it was Olena who had murdered Joffrey, to her initial disbelief, however, as Jaime talks her through it, pointing out that Olena had far more to gain from killing Joffrey than Tyrion, Cersei is forced to concede he is telling the truth, and angrily berates Jaime for talking her into giving Olena a merciful death. Jaime insists that House Lannister will follow House Tyrell into the grave if the war continues, but Cersei, to his dismay, makes it plain she intends to fight on to the bitter end both of them knowing that Daenerys will do the same, and is more dangerous with the victory she has just achieved. Cersei surmises to say that she would rather fight and die, as she knows she will be killed even if she surrenders. Later, Bronn brings Jaime to the catacombs of the Red Keep for a secret training session, but Jaime finds Tyrion waiting for him. Though genuinely upset with his brother, Jaime agrees to hear him out, and Tyrion explains that Daenerys is requesting an armistice to defeat the White Walkers, before continuing the war at hand. Upon returning to his sister's chambers, Jaime relays this information to Cersei. After Cersei seemingly agrees to the ceasefire, she informs Jaime she is now pregnant with his child. A stunned Jaime asks who she will say the father is. Cersei simply responds, you, and the two embrace in happiness. In preparation for the summit, Grey Worm has the Unsullied lined up outside the city walls, watched by a nervous Jamie and Bronn. Jamie wonders how Bronn is unnerved by the idea of soldiers without genitalia, as he's been around enough soldiers to know why they fight, 
and that the idea of soldiers who fight for no promise of sex is alien to him. As they talk, hordes of Dothraki ride in, a stark contrast to the disciplined Unsullied. But the two ancient enemies are united in cause today. Jamie realizes that if this was an attack, they would lose. Jamie later accompanies Cersei to the parley with Queen Daenerys and King John at the Dragon Pit. He spots Brienne among the Northern Assembly and the two stare at each other. Jamie quickly looks away from Brienne when he realizes that Cersei has noticed. When Euron Greyjoy attempts to derail the meeting and begins insulting Tyrion, Jamie angrily tells him to sit down. As the parley continues, proof of the army of the dead is shown, and Daenerys tells her story of how she saw them. Jaime asks her of the enemy numbers and he is shocked when she tells him of their overwhelming numerical superiority at around at least 100,000. When Cersei leaves the parley in outrage due to Jon's public pledge of loyalty to Daenerys, Brienne urges Jaime to convince Cersei to help. After trying and failing to do so, Jaime later wishes Tyrion luck when he arrives to do the same. After Cersei relents, Jaime wastes no time assembling the commanders of the Lannister army in preparation for the march north. He is outraged when Cersei interrupts this meeting and reveals she lied about aiding the north in the war against the dead. Jaime angrily protests that the undead are a threat to every living thing, but Cersei dismisses his concerns, preferring to let Jon and Daenerys exhaust themselves against the Night King, then have her forces deal with whoever emerges victorious from that conflict boasting that Euron Greyjoy will soon ferry the Golden Company to Westeros in order to secure the Lannister position. Jaime is beside himself with fury that Cersei and Euron plotted this behind his back, only to be left reeling when Cersei accuses him of plotting with Tyrion to advance the cause of their enemies. An incredulous Jaime argues that either way someone is going to win the war in the north, and either the army of the dead will march in full force to claim the rest of Westeros or the victorious Targaryen, Northern Alliance will seek retribution for Cersei's betrayal. After his protests fall on deaf ears, Jaime declares that he intends to travel north to honor his pledge. As he turns to leave, Sir Gregor blocks his path, causing Jaime to wonder if Cersei is actually going to have him executed. When Jaime uses Cersei's own words to remind her that their father and all their family members are dead, Tyrion having been disinherited, she assures him there is, one more yet to come. Jaime becomes disgusted by Cersei's will to do anything to keep herself in power. Nodding to Clegane, he tells his sister to give the order. After a moment's hesitation, she nods and Clegane draws his sword. However, since Cersei doesn't actually speak the words, a thoroughly disgusted Jaime calls her bluff. He storms out, leaving a saddened Cersei behind him. He abandons his Lannister armor for simpler garb and departs King's Landing alone. On the ride north, he pulls a riding glove over his golden hand and notices that it has begun to snow, indicating that winter has finally come to King's Landing. 